Hey, this is Jamie from Stillmeyer Games, and today I'm really excited to talk about a topic that, uh, that's been on my mind for a while, and that is games that have different modes of play. Um, and by this, I don't mean games with different scenarios. I think that's kind of, maybe kind of a subcategory of this. I also don't mean games with solo modes, um, because uh, that's just a different player count. So having a diff different player counts is, uh, is not under the category of modes. What I may mean by this, are games that have, and I'll have some examples over here, games that have like a co-op mode and then a competitive mode, maybe a team mode, a campaign mode, um, a, uh, a mode for one versus many, um, a timed versus an untimed mode, a family mode, a beginner and advanced mode, all these different modes of play, essentially different variants of play, but uh, more than just a variant, like a completely different mode of play. I think cooperative versus competitive uh, within the same game would be an example of this. I'm going to share my, my some thoughts on this, and I'll go into this saying that um, I have a little bit of bias here, I think, against games with multiple modes. My bias is that in general, I want the designers and the publishers of games to pick the very best way to play the game and let me know what that way is because there's a decent chance that I might only play the game once. And so I want to play the very best version of the game right out of the gate. Um, and so I want to play whatever mode that is that they've determined are best. I want the designer and publisher the, to do the job for me of deciding which version of the game is best. However, I've read a lot of good comments from our ambassadors about this. I'm going to read through a lot of them today for this video. And I think they have um, informed me a little bit as to um, the value that some people place on having different modes in games. And I appreciate that. I, I appreciate different perspectives. I do want to bring up a little chart, a little pie chart from the ambassador responses. Um, oh, and also one, one reason I'm bringing this up today is that I've seen this a lot with crowdfunding. I've seen this as a way to almost, um, as kind of a stretch goal mode, a stretch goal implementation for different crowdfunding campaigns. That instead of adding more stuff for the primary mode, they'll add different modes of play. So they'll add, uh, if you reach a certain stretch goal, you unlock the cooperative mode. If you reach a different stretch goal, you unlock the, the advanced mode, things like that. Um, so it feels very tied to crowdfunding right now. Although some of the games on the stack, I'm looking at the games that I, that I have, a few of them weren't crowdfunded, um, but, but some of them were. Uh, so I did poll Stellmeyer Ambassadors and I asked them, what's your general take on games with multiple modes of play? And it was a little bit of a vague answer. I wouldn't take this, this data uh, as, as completely hard data because I, I didn't phrase the question perhaps as clearly as I should have. But um, the responses were, I can't even see the green category. The green category is around maybe a little under 10%. And it says it's a huge red flag when I see a game with multiple modes of play. So really a very small percentage indicates a, a big red flag to people for that. Um, that might be the kind of category that I fall into a little bit. Maybe not a huge red flag, but a red flag. At 17%, I love having multiple modes. So 17% of people, still a pretty small percentage, but there is a percentage of people who really, really love having multiple modes of play. Then I, the, the next response was around 25%. I prefer for the designer publisher to focus on the best mode of play for most people. And really that's the category that I fall into now that I'm reading that. Uh, I prefer for the designer publisher to focus on the best mode for most people. So focus, focus on the best mode and just put that in the game. That's 25% of people. And then we have the biggest category uh, of almost 55% say, I like the options though I typically only use one. So I think this is indicative that people like the idea of having multiple modes. They like that idea, but they only actually use one, one of those modes. So I might return to this data a little bit later. Let's read some of the anecdotal responses from ambassadors. I asked them what their favorite game is that features multiple modes of play in which you actually use more than one mode. I'm not going to read every answer here. I'll read some that maybe appear a little bit more often and some that have uh, some explanations, some great explanations from uh, from the uh, from the ambassadors. One here is Archipelago. The person said, I really like the short, medium, long game choice. And yes, I think this is this is an interesting way to phrase it. Um, an interesting type of mode that that uh, that I think is, is pretty valid, actually offering a, a short version of the game. In this case, a medium version and a long version. I think I more often see like a short version and then a full length version or short version and a long version. Um, but Archipelago, it's been a little while since I've played Archipelago, but Archipelago does offer that option. And oftentimes in games, it's done by uh, determining this, the number of rounds 
Um, you can just change the number of rounds. Or if there's a key threshold that you're trying to reach in the game, you can just lower that threshold for the short, ver short version of the game. Um, maybe my, my main hesitancy with this is if you can actually offer the full game experience in a shorter mode, why wouldn't that be, why isn't that just the best mode and the mode of play? That to me, that strikes me as maybe a little odd. And maybe you can think of some examples here in the comments of games where uh, they actually get better the longer they are, but that's pretty rare. I, I think for me, at least personally, that's pretty rare that a game, that the longer version of the game is the better version. Maybe it feels more epic just because it's longer, but, uh, but I don't. I don't know. I'm, I'm, I'm not entirely sold on that. The next example was Australia with expansions. The base game has two different maps, so that's not really a different mode. I wouldn't call that a different mode. Um, the expansion one provides a new, smaller map specifically for two, the two-player mode. Okay, I can see that, having a, a different mode by player count. This video isn't really about player count scaling, though, so I mean, I'll, I'll maybe skip over those comments if I see more of them. Um, in the ex second expansion, it can be integrated into the two-player game to make a third player control the old ones. Okay, so that is a different mode of play. It takes a kind of a semi, semi cooperative I think Australia, it's been a while since I played Australia. I believe it's a competitive game with semi cooperative elements. Um, but that changes that and makes it a one versus many game. One player versus two other players. That is a different mode of play for sure. And I, this is something that I've, I've seen in a few of these games where, uh, in fact, the next example here too, Betrayal Legacy, where um, a cooperative game or a competitive game can become a one versus many game, having a player take over control of the AI instead of the AI controlling that. Uh, in Betrayal Legacy, Betrayal Legacy is kind of interesting because in every single game of Betrayal Legacy, or most games of it, it starts off as a fully cooperative game and then it changes in the middle of the game to a different mode of play where you have a trader and suddenly it is a one versus many game. This is baked into the essence of Betrayal and Betrayal Legacy. And that, I think, is really cool. If a game within the construct, in the, within the same session of the game, you're actually getting multiple modes in based on something that happens organically in the game itself, or not organically, it's planned to happen in Betrayal. Um, I think that's really cool. That way you're not even choosing the mode. The game is choosing for you uh, while you're playing. I don't want to spoil anything about Betrayal Legacy while I'm saying that, but that is a core element of, of Betrayal itself. One of the examples I thought of is Bullet... Bullet Heart, one of my recent favorite games. I've really, really been enjoying this game. I taught it to a few friends a couple of weekends ago, um, and I have only played the cooperative mode so far. So this kind of feels like a dueling game. It's bag building, but you're building the bag of the player to your left, and so having stuff in your bag isn't good. You're putting stuff from your pool, and you're putting it in their bag. Um, but the game also comes with a cooperative mode, and it's pretty seamlessly integrated into the game in that all you do is you choose one of the heroines and you flip it over to the backside, and that becomes a, a bad guy that everyone is trying to fight against instead of um, everyone fighting against each other. I do need to try this mode. I have heard good things about it. Um, but the, And this is a classic example of a, of a competitive game also having a cooperative mode that is probably pretty well designed. I don't think that that's always the case, but sometimes I think they can put equal effort, designers can put equal effort into the competitive and the cooperative modes. However, what I found with this game is that A, I enjoy the competitive mode, and so why would I try another mode? I, know, I already know that I enjoy it. And B, I have to learn more game if I want to learn the, the cooperative mode. So there's there's like th this game has a very short rule book and it has essentially a whole other rule book just for the cooperative mode. And so do I really want to spend my game learning time learning a different mode for the same game? Um, I don't know, probably not. But, uh, but at the same time, I can see the argument that if I already know that I love a game, maybe it is worth spending, maybe it's worth my time more to spend time learning the cooperative mode of a game that I already know that I love versus a game, a completely new game that I don't know if I love yet. So I can see that as well. I'm gonna play devil's advocate a lot in today's video. I'm just showing you different perspectives, I think, on the value or lack of value um, of having multiple modes of a game. Uh, let's see. Someone says, I prefer extra modes to come in expansions, like Viticulture World adding cooperative play. I'll get to Viticulture World later. It's on the bottom of my stack here. Um, in Amber Mines for Near and Far, it adds a cooperative option. Or the Rise of Fenris, which I don't have in my stack, but yeah, we'll talk about Rise of Fenris in a second. Rise of Fenris added a campaign mode to, uh, to Scythe. I'll come back to this about in reference to Viticulture World in a moment. I'll come back. I'm doing these in alphabetical order, roughly. 
Um, so I mentioned D&D, which I still haven't played, uh, Dungeons and Dragons. They mentioned that there are one-shot versions of the game versus campaign versions. And we see that in tabletop games as well. There's a one-shot version of a game that you can just reset and have plenty of variability built, baked into the game. Or you can play a campaign version of it. That, that, is, a, that is a viable approach to a game. I think, I'm trying to think of my, um, my assumptions when I hear about that. Like, I think my instinct is sometimes that if a game is designed to be a campaign game, does it is it as good as a one-off game is that a, kind of a maybe a yellow flag a small flag a small warning signal that the uh that there isn't that much variability in the core game itself and that's why they not that not that's why they added the campaign but they kind of added it after the campaign just to offer that possibility whereas like someone said a second ago if um if it is a, a an expansion that to me is a clear signal that they made the core game as good as it can possibly be, and then later they added another campaign mode. Um, that delineating those two, but with an expansion, I think uh, is a little bit reassuring. That's a little, a little bit more reassuring to me. In Detective City of Angels, there is a one versus all where the all are actually also competing with each other, and a one versus all where the all are cooperating, and a fully cooperative cooperative version and all modes work insanely well none of them feel tacked on at all and i think that that uh, this comment um taps into one of my concerns with multiple modes that sometimes they can feel tacked on especially if they are a stretch goal on a kickstarter campaign uh that could feel a little tacked on but in this case it sounds like the uh, the designer put equal amounts of work into all of them one other thing about that that i should mention is that it's still <laughs> As a designer and as a publisher, I know how much time we spend getting one single version of our games correct and, and awesome, as awesome as it can be. So to do all that and then to say, okay, we've got that right, let's also now spend an equal amount of time and resources making a completely separate version of this game that feels the same, uses a lot of the same rules, but is also its own thing and also works just as well as this thing that we already spent tons of time on is, I think very difficult to do. I mean, just even psychologically to spend all this time on one thing and be like, okay, now we're going to do it again in a different way in the same game. And so I'm glad that it doesn't, that some of these designers have pulled it off where it doesn't feel tacked on. But I bet in most cases, there is a primary mode and the other modes were secondary and a lot less time was spent on those modes. And sometimes there's a little bit of luck in there where those modes just happen to be just as good. And sometimes that's not the case. Um, let's see. Uh, okay. Someone mentions pendulum here. I'm going to go out of alphabetical order here, but I thought this was a good mention. Someone mentioned captain sonar and pendulum as having timed versus real time play or timed versus untimed play. And so pendulum, I have it in alphabetical order in my stack, here, but I'll pull it out. Pendulum does that. And so I believe this was something that either came up in a play test or the, the designer thought of. But in Pendulum, it is designed to be a simultaneous game with timers. It is real time, but it's more simultaneous. You're doing some things and timer, time is a resource in the game. But if you're teaching Pendulum, um, what we say in the rules is that you can turn the hourglasses sideways. If you need to stop and teach something in that moment, you can turn the hourglasses sideways. But even just having the presence of the hourglasses can add extra stress to people. And so the designer realized that he could add an untimed mode to the game. So there is a completely untimed version in the game, in Pendulum, that works exactly the same as the timers, except you don't use the timers. Um, it's kind of just a step-by-step -step thing that you go through over the course of the game. And it works very well, and it works for teachability. And so I'm going to make an exception here with modes that help onboard people into the full experience of the game, I think that's awesome. And that was the purpose of the untimed mode. It was, it was an onboarding uh, adjustment for the game where it would be a, it's an easier way to teach the game to people. So you teach the, people, the game to people in the untimed mode. And then once they understand it, even in future rounds of the game, you can spend one round doing untimed and then switch to timed play in the second round within the same game. It works completely fine. I think that is a decent reason to have uh, different modes in a game. In fact, I would I would highlight there in particular the idea of switching in the middle of the teaching game itself. So you ha don't have to go through a complete teaching game before you can play like the real version of the game. 
if you can break it down a little bit and, and have a stopping point and say, okay, we've taught the game using this easier mode of play, using the family mode or the untimed mode, whatever that is. And now for the rest of the game, we're going to play the real way, the full way, the advanced way. Um, I think that works really well. I Love Cats was brought up, and I do have I Love Cats beloved in my collection here, or in our collection. In I Love Cats, uh, there is a family mode. I'm mentioning that here right now. There is a family mode in I Love Cats, which is just a slightly easier way to play than the full mode of the game. Um, I think I, I've never used the family mode. And I will say, as much as I appreciate the intent behind it for accessibility, um, I think it actually can cause some confusion when you have multiple modes. I think this is a good example of the confusion that can be added because there's a whole separate set of cards that's used for family mode that isn't used for the standard mode of play. And so whenever I'm pulling stuff out of the box to play the Isle of Cats, if I haven't played it in a few months, um, sometimes it's kind of hard to tell which cards actually go into the version of the game that I play versus the cards that go into the family mode. And so having those components, having both sets of components in the game, it shows that, that they went all in for the, uh, for the family mode. I appreciate that having a different set of components, but it leads to a little bit of confusion when I need to set up the game for the mode of play that I want to play. It's clear in the rules. I'll say that perfectly clear in the rules, but just by having different components in the box, uh, it, it leads to a little bit of confusion when I do set up. Um, uh, someone, someone also, someone actually says they play both the family mode and the regular mode in Isle of Cats. Uh, A few people mentioned Imperial Assault. I don't remember the multiple modes in that. I think it's probably uh, having an AI versus one versus many. Um, a few people mentioned Magic the Gathering. Magic the Gathering, I think, is a, a great example of this. Magic the Gathering has a ton of different modes. They use a different term for modes. Formats. Formats of Magic the Gathering. But there are different modes of play. You can play Commander. You can play Standard. You can play Draft. Uh, and in a competitive game like this, like Magic the Gathering, uh, I think the game kind of has flourished thanks to those modes and thanks to Wizards of the Coast, eventually, maybe a little slower than I think people hoped, embracing the different formats and encouraging them and making them official and making entire sets built around specific formats. I think Commander now is apparently the most um, most played version of Magic, whereas I only play Draft and I used to play Standard and Standard, I think, used to be the most popular format. Um, but yeah, I think in collectible games like that, Collectible games that are intended to be played kind of in a tournament atmosphere almost. I think that can work pretty well, especially since Commander isn't, I don't think that's really all that much of a, uh, a tournament format. That's more of a format geared towards casual game night play. Um, Lands of Galzir is on here too. Lands of Galzir is a very recent example that has made me think a lot about this because the game includes, for every session of a game in Lands of Galzir, even though it's kind of an ongoing persistent story, it's not a campaign, but ongoing persistent story, and ongoing persistent mechanisms too. It Every single session can be played either cooperatively or competitively. And the game even says, they kind of encourage you to play both. They say both are completely viable, both are fully designed, and both just offer a different experience. You're either working together with the other player or you are working to do better than the other player or, or players. And I think that's neat. I think that's neat that, that uh, Sammy, I believe Sammy is the designer of this, Sammy Lasko, yeah, and Seppo, that they did that, that they offered different, uh, a competitive and a cooperative version. That said, I've only played the cooperative version. I don't really plan to play the competitive version. Maybe I should from a design perspective to see what they did with it. But as I was playing the cooperative version, I kind of had a sense for how it would feel to, pay comp to play competitively, to have my uh, prestige or whatever I'm earning in Lands of Galzir, to have that be higher than the other player, to have that matter. But that wasn't the style of investment that I had in Lands of Galzir. Like I, I was equally invested in knowing what, what Megan was doing as she was playing as I was my own story. And I didn't really want to get in the way of what she was doing. Um, so even in cooperative mode, we kind of went to separate parts of the map and did our own thing. Um, so I don't know. Yeah, I, I guess I, I appreciate that Sammy included it. I think maybe on a small level, it... When you include multiple modes of play like that, it can come across maybe just a little bit as indecisive to me. That the designer just couldn't decide which version they liked more. In fact, there are two designers on this box. Maybe Seppo liked one version better and Sammy liked the other version. They, they put them both on there. But, uh, but as a player, as a gamer, and again, as someone who might only play the game once, I, I really want one version recommended to me. Um, 
and really highlight it and have the other ver- the other version of the game maybe feel secondary. I think almost that can help if the other version of the game, the other mode feels secondary so that I can feel like I'm playing the official version of the game, the way that it was intended to be played, that sort of thing. Um, someone mentions that in Mansions of Madness and Unfathomable, the game mode changes from co- co-op to competitive in certain situations. So this is a little bit similar to Betrayal, where depending on what happens organically during the game itself, the game can switch from being cooperative to competitive. And I think that is really cool. I, I will say, I, th- I think that is really neat that that can happen in the middle of the game itself. Um, as long as players know that it could happen. Because I think sometimes if players sit down and opt into, say, a cooperative experience and five minutes into the game, it becomes an all-out uh, battle against players competitively. That might be a little jarring to some players who thought they were getting something else. But uh, but if they go into it knowing that that mode of play can switch during the game itself, I think that can be really cool. Maracaibo is one that came to mind. That's on, on the list here. Maracaibo is one that has single play modes and it also has a campaign mode where uh, I, I believe it's certain cards that you that you are gaining during the game, they can end up being shuffled in, into the deck permanently um, rather than being left out. And it's the type of campaign where you don't need to play with the same people every time. It's just that the deck itself, for the most part, that's the thing that's evolving over the course of many games. That, that deck is getting bigger and bigger with more and more cards. And some cards are being removed from that deck but based on decisions that you made. And I think that can be kind of interesting. When the, when the campaign mode is so seamlessly ingrained into the game, that it's not like it's not a scenario based campaign it's just some core element some core component of the game like Maracaibo, also like in lands of galzir where that's changing i think that can be um can be pretty neat uh i'd almost say this about Maracaibo that i i wonder maybe a little bit why that just wasn't that isn't the way that you always play it that isn't just the way that you play it and, and maybe it is. Maybe I haven't looked at the rulebook. Maybe the rulebook does say that uh, this, the single play mode, the one shot version of it, is secondary to this ongoing, evolving deck version, campaign version of the game. Uh, Marvel Legendary. So I think this is somewhat of an infamous, infamous example. They say it's a cooperative game, cooperative game, but you can also play for points against other players. So you can compete to see who can be the best at cooperating in Marvel Legendary. I have never heard of anyone actually playing that way, um, but uh, but I but that is a way that you can play the game. A few people mention Marvel United. I'm not familiar, familiar with the different modes of play in that game. I've only played it once. Uh, Moonraker. So Moonraker is one that did have a, uh, a crowdfunding crowdfunding campaign. I think last year that featured a lot of different modes of play that you could pick that you could select. They were an expansion form, so they have an app that you can play cooperative scenario. The new expansions. Have I believe there's a one versus many. There might be a, another different mode. They, they aren't fully listed here in the comments, but I know they had like different expansions for every mode of play. So you can kind of pick the mode of play that you wanted to play Moonrakers in and get specifically that mode of play and have it as an expansion to the game. I think that's pretty pretty well done. Um, let's see that. This person says my favorite, my current favorite is the Power Rangers deck building game due to its asymmetric gameplay combined with multiple mode possibilities. Oh, but they don't say what the modes are, so I don't know what, what they are there. Near and Far. Near and Far is one that, uh, it's been a while since I played it, but in Near and Far, it is a game from Red Raven Games' Ryan Lockett. It's a wonderful game where you spend part of the time in a village and then you go out and venture out into the wild. And it has a campaign version. It also has a one-off version. And it has, or you can just like complete replayability. And it also has a different campaign version where you're focused on the characters, I believe, a lot more than uh, than the collective story of the game. So that is really interesting to me that you could have two different campaigns, essentially, one focused on characters and one focused on the world and the story, um, and also have a one-off version of the game. Um, yeah, very interesting to have that in in uh, near and far. Oh, it's called arcade arcade mode. That's someone mentioned that arcade mode. Nemesis offers different ways that you can play cooperative, full co-op, campaign versus the untold stories, and a great solo mode. Yeah, obviously solo mode isn't, doesn't qualify for this based on my arbitrary reasons of player count not applying to this. But um, let's see, they, they call it self-interested co-op versus full co-op. And yeah, I think there are different styles of cooperative play. You have the full cooperative play where everyone is always looking out for everyone else's best interest. You have the self-interested co-op play where you have your own specific mission that you need to accomplish and you can only win, or everyone can only win, or there are only some players who can win if everyone wins and you accomplish your mission. And there's also, uh, and this kind of ties to Nemesis and a few other games here, I think uh, Dead of Winter was mentioned earlier, 
without examples, but uh, a cooperative with a trader. So you can play cooperative or cooperative with the trader, which I, I do consider a different mode of play because if you have a trader, then it isn't actually fully cooperative. Orleans is an example of a game that has uh, an expansion that offers a different mode of play. In Orleans Invasion, it offers cooperative play. It adds cooperative play to the game. And again, I am I feel better about as a gamer, as a buyer, someone who's buying games, if I see a different mode of play in an expansion itself, uh, because it feels like they fully committed to that whatever that mode of play for the expansion. Orleans does it. Um, Shards of Infinity does it. Shards of Infinity is a kind of a dueling game, but there is a cooperative expansion that I that that we love. Megan and I love playing through the Shadow of Salvation uh, uh, campaign pack, and it also is just a we can play it cooperatively from now on if we want if we want to play that way, and and we really prefer to play it that way. Um, let me jump to actually Viticulture World while I'm talking about that example. So Viticulture World is a cooperative expansion to a competitive game. And this is the one downside that I mentioned from the publisher perspective. And this game, this expansion has done pretty well. But when I announced an expansion for Viticulture after not announcing anything for Viticulture for a long time, I was really excited to do it, to announce it, because uh, partially because of Orleans. Orleans Invasion really inspired it, where I was like, you know, this is a really, really cool expansion. Let's do something like that with Viticulture. But because there were so many people who play Viticulture, who like Viticulture, even love Viticulture, because it's a competitive game, when they learned that there was a cooperative expansion, they checked out. They didn't want the cooperative mode. That wasn't something, that wasn't why they played Viticulture. Um, and there was a number, another a number of people, tens of thousands of people who have bought it, who were willing to try it at least, and were curious about it. And I think there were maybe some who were really excited about it. They wanted a different mode to play to play a mode of play to play Viticulture. They wanted to cooperate instead of compete with the other players. And Viticulture World does some really, really cool things with cooperation. But I think this is something to keep in mind, that if you have a uh, an evergreen game, a game that has been around for a long time, and you've released multiple expansions that reinforce the core mode of play, and then suddenly out of left field, you throw a completely different mode of play, and people may not buy into it, because that's not why they've why they love the game. That's not why they're into the game. So that was a good reminder for me in uh, with Viticulture. A few people mentioned Pandemic here. Uh, I think they're thinking of like the different versions of Pandemic rather than different modes of play. Uh, let's see. Return to Dark Tower, which I haven't played. It says can be fun, both cooperative and competitive. And Great Wall also has cooperative and competitive. A lot of games with cooperative versus competitive. Um, the Rise of Fenris is another one uh, that I mentioned a little bit earlier. The Rise of Fenris is, an, is a campaign expansion for, for Scythe. And it also includes a cooperative mode in it that uh, it's just a little, it's almost, it's a small part of it. It is not part of the campaign. It's its, its own mode of play in that expansion. But I thought if I was ever going to do it, there, there it is if people want it. Um, but yeah, again, I, 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 having a campaign expansion for those who want it, who want to buy into that campaign experience for a game that they already know and enjoy, that I think can be a good thing for some people. I think I'd be more inclined to do that in the future for an existing game than to have a, uh, than to have a completely different mode of play, like competitive versus cooperative um, for a game that has been one of those versions for a long time. Let's see, I thought this comment was, was interesting. Um, Santorini. Santorini has a little bit of this, but honestly, multiple modes has never been particularly exciting to me. I would rather developers focus on a solid core experience that scales well. Um, and this person says, to be honest, this is why I was not excited about Viticulture World. I was selfishly, selfishly hoping that it would be another interesting wrinkle on the competitive game that I love so much. That's what you can run into. I think if you throw a competitive mode at a cooperative game or com co uh, competitive mode or yeah, competitive mode at a uh, cooperative mode, cooperative game. Someone also mentioned Rising Sun, where there's a competitive mode, a cooperative mode, a one versus all, and, a, and team play. So all the modes in Rising Sun, apparently. Um, I've, I've talked about that a little bit, my, my thoughts on that. Let's see if there are any more good examples here. Uh, oh, here's something I, I think someone mentioned about the Rise of Fenris. Uh, they say, the Rise of Fenris was such a cool idea. I've only played through the campaign once, but I fully intend to go again. I've used a number of the modules outside the campaign as well. And I think this is a neat thing for designers to do. If they have a campaign expansion where they unlock new stuff, give players a way to pick and choose the things that they like the most to integrate permanently into their one-shot version of that game. I think that can be really helpful. It can 
exponentially expand the replayability of a game by doing that. Let's see if there are any more good examples here. I see a lot of great examples here. I'm not reading a lot of it. Um, a few people mentioned Tiny Epic Zombies, which I have not played. And uh, talk about Viticulture World a little bit more. Yeah. Yeah, so just to me, a really interesting topic of, of games that offer different modes. As you can tell, I'm a little bit more on the fence now having read through these ideas than I was at the beginning of the video when I pr uh, shared this idea with ambassadors. Uh, I, I, I would still say that I would prefer for designers and publishers to pick the best version of the game, focus on that, and let me know what that best version is. And if they want to release an expansion later that has a completely different version of it, awesome. If they want it on the last page of the rulebook to put a, a, a variant in it, go for that too. I'm saying that off the cuff. I'm not even sure if I entirely agree with that because that inherently comes across as something that was tacked on. Um, but for the most part, I want the best version of the game. Uh, I, I, I want, and I want the designer and the publisher to spend their time figuring that out so that I can use my time playing only that best version of the game. Um, and so I think really, for me, I would say the main conclusion is that if you are going to add mode, different modes of play to do it in an expansion and do it in such a way that you aren't completely flipping the core game on its head, especially uh, for competitive and cooperative play. Uh, but also if you wanted to, to look at, uh, oh, in fact, I didn't mention one of my favorites here, Summit. I did want to mention Summit before I go, because Summit does this with expansion. Summit, but it also does it out of the box. In Summit, it is a game about climbing a mountain. And out of the box, it offers a cooperative play, cooperative play, and it also offers competitive play. And there's an expansion for teams. There's an expansion for one versus many, I think. Um, but out of the box, it has cooperative and competitive play. And I've never played, or maybe only once, maybe have I played the competitive version. I much prefer the cooperative version. I really like the cooperative version of Summit. But one thing that I Inside Up does it did in that rulebook that I didn't love is that they only have one rulebook for both of them. And the reason for that is that a lot of the rules are redundant. They're, they're repeated between the two modes. But it actually makes it fairly difficult to look up the rules for one of the modes, even though they're clearly delineated in the rulebook. Because they're next to each other in the rules, it's fairly difficult to delineate, delineate the two. So um, if you are going to have two different rules with uh, two different modes of play with a significant rules differences at certain points, I would recommend having two different rule books. I know it adds a little, a little bit to the cost, but uh, but if, you, if, you, if the publisher is all that far in on having multiple modes of play, I think having two different rule, rule books is the best way to serve players who want to play one version over the other version. So that's a little thought for publishers as well. I'd love to hear your thoughts though. Let me know your favorite game where you actually use multiple modes of play and let me know your thoughts in general on multiple modes of play. How do you fall into these categories? Are you in the uh, the, the red flag category? Are you in the, that, that you love having multiple modes? Would you prefer for the designer publisher to pick what the best mode is? Or do you just like having the options and you'll figure out the best mode for yourself, but, but you do like those options in the game? Let me know your thoughts in the comments below. Thank you.